In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today we read the passage from John chapter 6, which is a famous chapter that speaks about uh, the Eucharist and the Lord speaking about how we have to eat his body and drink his blood in order to have life. Um, and this was said after the feeding of the multitude, um, where the people were seeking after the physical food, and the Lord was making it known to them that the spiritual food that he offered them was of greater value and importance than the physical food that they were seeking. And he says to them, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And this is actually uh, a difficult teaching for many people. And actually, at that time, when people heard him say this, it says that many of the disciples left him and did not follow him anymore because they could not accept the idea that they were to eat his body and to drink his blood. But of course, they were, to, they were supposed to understand it in a spiritual way, that they weren't going to actually eat his physical flesh, but they were going to eat it in the form of the bread and the wine that the Lord was going to offer to them. But because they couldn't understand it, they, they felt like it was beyond what their ability to do, and this is why they left. So I'm going to speak a little bit today about some of the difficult teachings of the Lord. Um, of course, this uh, institution of the Eucharist is one of those difficult teachings that was difficult for the people to, to accept. Um, when, when the Lord said this to them, they said, Is it not this, Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? When he speaks about himself saying, I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven, they said, This is a man, we kn we've known him all of our lives. We've known him since he was a child. How can he say about himself that he is the bread of life and that he came down from heaven and he is offering himself to us to eat in this way? And it says uh, that many of the disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? So how do we understand this teaching? So when the Lord instituted the Eucharist for us, he was providing a means of communion so that we can be in communion with him, that we can be one with him, that we can be in a state of, of like joining together with God to, to accept from him all of his blessings, to, to have all of his attributes apparent and manifested in us, that we can have a communion of love with him in a very intimate way that is beyond any other of the creation. There's no other creation that God has granted to partake of him in this way other than we, um, the human beings. But it was a difficult teaching for the people. And actually, even the apostles themselves, even the ones who they believed what the Lord said, they didn't leave, but it was difficult for them to understand. Even up to this day, there are many Christians from various churches that do not believe still that in the communion we're actually partaking of the actual body and blood of God. So this was a difficult teaching. And, and there are many difficult teachings that we have to accept by faith. Another one is baptism. Um, when Christ was speaking to Nicodemus, um, he told him that in order for, so for someone to enter the kingdom of God, they have to be born again. And Nicodemus, when he heard this, it says what? Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Of course, again, the Lord was speaking about a spiritual birth, not a physical one. In the mind of Nicodemus, he would say, how is it possible for a person to be born from his mother's womb again after having been born already, right? It was a difficult teaching. It was something impossible for him to comprehend because he was looking at it only with the human mind and the human senses, just as with the Eucharist. When the people said, how is it possible for us to eat his flesh? It didn't make any sense. Here, how is it possible for a person to be born again from uh, the, their mother's womb, it didn't make any sense. And one of the problems that the Jewish people had all throughout the Old Testament is they looked at everything that God did only with the physical eye. They didn't see things in a spiritual light. They didn't understand the spiritual meaning behind the things that they were doing. They focused only on fulfilling the law. This is why when the Messiah came, they didn't recognize him. They didn't see him as being the Messiah. They, they were expecting a person who was going to act differently, someone who was going to be powerful, not in spirit, but in the flesh, someone who was going to be a mighty king and a ruler. And when he came and he offered himself in this way to them, they said, this is not what we're looking for. This is not what we are seeking. But of course, the Lord here is speaking about the spiritual birth and how we need to be born again in order to become the children of God, to have eternal life. Another point of stumbling uh, for the people was the Lord's crucifixion. After um, the Lord revealed that he must be killed 
um, in order for the, the, for him to accomplish salvation, it says, Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Again, what was the idea? How could people accept the idea that this man who was supposed to be the Messiah, the anointed, was going to be killed at the hands of the chief priests? So again, the people didn't understand the purpose. What was the reason? Of course, we know that the Lord came to die for our sins, for us to have eternal life. The people at the time didn't understand this, and they were not looking for this. Again, they were looking for a warrior. They were looking for a, a strong and powerful king. They were not looking for a person to die on their behalf because they couldn't un understand the reason why this was important or necessary or what was it actually accomplishing for them. So again, it was a stumbling block. It was a difficult teaching for them to uh, accept or to understand. Another one is when the Lord washed the disciples' feet. When the disciples were gathered together and the Lord sat on the ground and he began to wash the disciples' feet, it says, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Right? The idea that, that, that God himself, that their master would sit on the ground and wash their feet was something difficult for them to accept. Why is it? And Peter looked at it from the perspective of, you know, you are the one that I should be giving honor to, so I should be washing your feet. And yet the Lord was giving us uh, an example of purification and how is it that we should serve one another. Again, it was a spiritual teaching. It wasn't about the feet. It wasn't about because their feet were dirty that he needed to wash the feet. But it was an act of humility and it was an act of love and it was an act of purification. All things that teach us today, um, spiritual teachings that we can understand. But again, at the time, the people did not understand it. The Lord also gave very difficult teachings regarding wealth uh, that people had in the world. When speaking about the rich young ruler, he said, And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Again, they looked at it from a physical perspective. They said, how is it that someone could be saved if, if everyone is going to be asked to give up all of their possessions? Right? It was a difficult teaching. Um, he's telling this man, give up all that you have and sell it and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he's saying, unless someone is, is, um, is, is able to do this, then they don't have salvation. This is how the, this is how the disciples understood it. But this was a, a, a lesson in self-denial. It wasn't just a lesson of give up all of your possessions. It was about self-denial. It was about giving up what is an obstacle between you and, and the Lord. That is the thing that has to be given up. He's not speaking literally about giving up all of our possessions, but there is a purpose behind his teaching. But the people didn't, again, they didn't understand this. They didn't look at the spiritual meaning behind the teaching. They focused only on um, what the Lord actually said literally. They didn't think about the narrow road versus the wide road. They didn't think about self-denial. They didn't think about how maybe we have idols in our lives that are keeping us from following him. Instead, they thought just literally, okay, so now God is saying that in order for us to have salvation, we have to sell everything that we have and to give it away. But again, that definitely was not what the Lord was teaching. And there are many, many others, uh, teachings that maybe if we read in the Bible, we scr scratch our heads and we say, how is it possible? How is it possible that a person could follow this or live this? Okay, so how do we deal with these difficult teachings? The first is we have to make sure that we have the right understanding. Sometimes when we first read something like this, we get the wrong perspective or wrong understanding of what it's saying or what God actually wants us to do. And because we have a wrong understanding, we go astray. In the early church, for instance, whenever the non-believers would hear that we as Christians were eating the body and blood of Christ, they considered the Christians to be cannibals, and, and they attacked Christians, saying that you are cannibals, right? Well, if obviously, if, if we are actually eating the flesh of a person, then it could be considered to be cannibals. But they didn't understand the spiritual meaning behind what it is that we were doing. So if you don't have a right understanding of the teaching, then it will not be accepted. And it will be something that maybe even if people practice it, they practice it in a, in a wrong way. They practice it in a, in a legalistic way without a right understanding. The Pharisees had this problem. The Pharisees, for instance, in their attempts to keep the Sabbath holy, would do things that bordered on ridiculous, um, trying to, f to fulfill the law exactly. For instance, um, there were certain laws about how far you could walk on the Sabbath day away from your home. 
So in order to get around these laws, they would take their personal items and they would place it in various places uh, around so they could consider that all of these places were actually part of their home and so they would be allowed to travel between these places because they would all be considered home. Or in some cases, they wouldn't walk through the threshold of their door um, because they would consider that if they walk through the threshold of their door, they would be considered going outside of their home. They would take the threshold with them and never cross it as though that this is going to mean that they stayed home. Again, there is no right understanding here. What was the purpose of the Sabbath? The purpose of the Sabbath was that it would be a day that's consecrated to God to worship Him and to, um, and, and to, to spend the day um, in, in contemplation and meditation and service and these different things that we can understand now in a spiritual sense. But they took it in a very literal way. So if we didn't have a right understanding of the commandment, then one, we will, we will not follow it correctly um, and two, we will not benefit from it, right? We won't benefit from the spiritual meaning behind it. So whenever there's a difficult teaching, first we have to understand what is actually being said. What is it that God actually wants us to do? Um, the second point is that we should start doing it now, even if we don't fully understand it, and that we would expect to understand it later. Sometimes we adopt the approach of, I first want to fully understand everything, and only once I understand it, then I will begin to practice it. But Actually, it should be the opposite, because in my practice, this is when I gain understanding. For instance, a person might want to be convinced that fasting is beneficial. Um, and I'm not going to fast until I prove to myself that fasting is beneficial. And maybe this person is going to research fasting. Maybe they're going to ask people about fasting. Maybe they're going to try to see whether fasting is justified. Um, from the scriptures or not, or whether fasting was being done in the early church or not. There's all kinds of things that a person might try to do to determine if fasting is actually a legitimate practice uh, or not. But until a person actually fasts and actually tastes the, the benefits of the fast, then they're not going to understand fasting. No matter what kind of research is done, no matter what scriptures are found regarding fasting, the person is truly not going to really understand the benefit of fasting until they fast. And this is um, true for many things that the Lord asks us to do. For instance, when he tells us to, to eat of his body and drink of his blood, we don't really understand the benefit of this until we do it, until we, until we have it, until we have the experience of being with God and being in communion with God. Or prayer. We say, what is the benefit of prayer? People will come and ask, what is, the, what, is the, what is it that prayer does? And they'll ask the question, well, if I hadn't prayed, would, would, would anything have changed than if I had prayed? And maybe we can ask a lot of these theoretical type questions regarding spiritual things because we try to understand the spiritual things kind of from a, from a, from a human, earthly perspective and to question it in that way. But until we actually practice it, until we do it, we won't have an answer. We won't have a satisfactory answer. And even when we hear the answers of other people, like if you go and ask a bishop or a monk, what is the benefit of prayer? They're going to give you an answer um, based on their experience. When King David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? It, it, their, their answer is based on their experience. And, and maybe, yes, the answer is interesting, and we want to hear what the answer is. But until we experience that ourselves, we have no context to really understand what, is, what are they saying. We have to taste it. We have to touch it ourselves in order to know what it is. So in many of the spiritual things that the Lord asks us to do, it is to be accepted um, just because he said so. Right, and to do it now and fully understand it later. The third point is that we should have faith that these things are beneficial for us even if we don't really have a satisfactory answer for how or why. Uh, again, back to the idea of the Eucharist. You know, how, how is it that the bread and the wine is transformed into the body and the blood of the Lord? We don't have an answer for this. You know, even sometimes people ask the question, at what exact point in the liturgy does this transformation happen? And sometimes people give an answer here or there, right? But do we really even know? We, we're praying the liturgy, we're asking the Holy Spirit to descend on, on, on the bread and the wine in order to transform them. And there's actually various prayers. It's not just at one point in the liturgy where, this is, where the priest asks for this. So at what point is it exactly that it happens? Well, maybe we don't know. Um, and it's okay that we don't know. Right? It's, that's why we call it a mystery. We call it, it is something beyond our comprehension and our understanding that we practice it because the Lord asks us to do it. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the waters of baptism, for instance, when we go into the water, we say, what, the person dies and then is resurrected. Okay, well, do we see this death? 
how do I how do I see the person looks the same when they go into the water and they come out they look the same actually the baptism itself takes one second you know like when I baptize people I tell them be ready because it's gonna be faster than you think right if you want to take a picture right it's very fast and what in what way that in this one second of this person going into the water and coming up again does their old nature die and they are resurrected again and they become children of God well, again, we take it on faith. We take it because the Lord said that this is what he would do. Not because it makes sense to me. Not because I have a full understanding of it and can describe it and tell you everything about it. It is, it is a mystery. It is something to accept through faith. So in all of the difficult teachings that the Lord gives us, we are called to accept it in faith. Even in things that are like um, historical, stories that happen in the Bible. A lot of people, for instance, they would have a problem with the idea of the story of Jonah the prophet. We're actually starting Jonah's fast tomorrow. Um, how is it possible that a person could be thrown off of a ship in the middle of a storm and get swallowed by a fish, and the fish takes that person a thousand miles to another place um, while he's there in the fish for three days, and then he spits him out on the pl on the place that he was supposed to go? Like it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. A and actually, I think anyone who is um, trying to rationalize it come up with a scientific explanation for how is it that such a thing could be might not find a scientific answer they might not find a satisfactory answer to where we can prove through evidence and through science that such a thing is even possible but we accept it by faith actually we accept much more difficult things by faith like the resurrection how do you believe that a person can raise themselves from the dead i mean if you can believe that the lord resurrected you can believe anything right you can believe anything that the lord says happen happen Right? So we accept it in simplicity, we accept it in faith, not because we can prove, right? It's a difficult teaching. It's not something that is obvious to us, but we accept it in faith. Um, the, the fourth point is the power of the word, meaning the word of God can teach and explain to us many things that uh, at first glance might not seem obvious. Um, the more we read the Word of God, the more we have an understanding of the way that God operates. We understand His character. We understand the way that He um, does things. And we see patterns of how He deals with people. Like when you read the stories of the Old Testament, you see patterns of the way that God deals with people. For instance, um, God does not reveal His entire plan from the beginning. This is something very consistent in the way that God deals with His people. He tells them one step. He says, I want you to do this step. He doesn't say why. He doesn't say what's going to happen. He doesn't say what the next step is. He just says, I want you to take this one step, and that's it. And then it's a test of faith again, right? If the people believe that, that in God, that he knows what he's doing, then they will take the step and observe and see what happens, right? And then God will tell them the next step to do. But the people who rejected God, like the perfect example is like the Israelites, when God took the Israelites up to the promised land the first time, and he told them, go and send spies, go send 12 spies, and um, go and, and see the land. And they came back and they said, yeah, the land is very good, but we can never inherit it. We can never take it because the people there are very big. They're giants. They're, they're too strong for us, and we will never have victory. And so they refused to enter, right? Because what they saw was something difficult for them to accept. So they walked away. But we, we learn from this example. When we read this story, we say, okay, when I have a similar situation where God is asking me to do something that is very difficult, very hard, right? And I, maybe I'm afraid to do it. And I say, you know what? I'm not doing it because I don't know how it to be done. Maybe I don't have faith that God is going to be with me in it. We look at the story and we say, no, it's a reminder for us that um, God is able and he's, 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 he's asking us to go in because he is able. Of course, 40 years later, the people entered right and they were able to have victory over everyone because god was with them and granting it to them so the word of god can explain many things to us and it can show us examples of the way that god deals with his people and an example of what it means to be faithful and what it means to be unfaithful what it means to be obedient what it means to be disobedient and so the more that we read about god's ways and god's character and the history of the people of god it can allow us to better understand some of these difficult teachings. The last point I want to mention is that we are called to acquire the mind of a spiritual person. This means that we grow in time not to look at things just with the physical eye. We don't just look at how things look like from the outside. We don't just use the logical mind alone in order to perceive things and understand the ways of God. We don't look at just the resources that we have and say, well, I don't have the resources 
um, in order to do something, so therefore I won't even try. See there, again, in, this, in the Word of God, many examples of people who didn't have resources. And actually there's cases where they had too many resources and God said, no, this is too many, like the story of Gideon. He says, you have too many people with you. Um, I, I, I'm not going to allow you to conquer your enemies with this many people, lest you think that you conquered them on your own and with your own strength. So I'm going to whittle down your people until there's only 300. And with these 300, I'm going to grant you victory. Who would think this way? Like this is contrary to any human thinking. No one would say this. Even if we didn't need all of the thousands and tens of thousands of people that we started with, it's still good to have them. Um, it's better to have them than not to have them, right? We, we, no one would think, no one would think, you know, I have too much money. I, 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 need, I don't want to have as much money. I need to have less money um, because if I have less money, then I'm going to feel that God is the one who's taking care of me, that God is the one who is providing for me. And I'm not going to place my trust in the money. I'm going to place my trust only in God. The, sp the spiritual person with the spiritual mind looks at things in the spiritual way, and they're not so attached to the physical things. They're not so attached to um, reason only and just pure rational thought but they think, you know, if God is with us, then he can grant victory. If God is with us, then King David can defeat Goliath, right? We don't look at it just from the, the, the physics of it, okay? How is, it how is it possible that such a short, you know, young man is going to defeat this giant warrior, right? No one would have bet on King David in that, um, in that matchup. No one would have bet that he would have been the one to win, and yet he's the one who won because God was with him. Again, as the person with a spiritual mind would look at that beforehand, like a person with a spiritual mind would look at this, this, this matchup between King David and Goliath, and they wouldn't immediately discount it. They wouldn't immediately say, you know what, there's no way. There's no way that David is going to beat Goliath. No, instead they would say, well, if God is with him, he can do anything, right? And, and really, the person with this type of spiritual mind is able to accept any teaching of the Lord, and they live their life in peace. Because the world is filled with Goliaths, and the world is filled with very difficult challenges and problems that we feel like cannot be surmounted, cannot be, um, cannot be defeated, that we can't have victory over, things that we struggle with for, for years and years, and we feel like there is no solution. But the person with the spiritual mind knows that God is able and can do uh, anything. So again, how do we deal with these difficult teachings? One, we have to make sure we have the right understanding. Two, we do it now knowing that we don't understand it yet, but maybe through our experience we will understand it later. We do it in faith, even if we don't know why, why God is even asking us to do this and what is the benefit of it, but we do it in faith. We read the Word of God and we see that in the Word there is, um, an un there is a sense of understanding and we, we grow an understanding of, of the way that God works. And the fifth is that we acquire the, the mind of a spiritual person so we can see everything in a spiritual way. Very different than the way the Jews saw things. This is why they crucified the Lord. They crucified him because they didn't have the spiritual mind. They, they, they crucified him because all he did was tell them things that were objectionable, that they couldn't understand and they didn't want to believe, and they missed out on the greatest blessing, on the greatest thing, which is salvation itself. So we, whenever we are faced with these difficult teachings or whenever we are faced with difficult challenges in our life, we are called to keep all of this in mind and to have the spiritual mind in order for us to believe in God and Him to grant us deliverance and glory be to God forever. Amen.